Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 25, Myth, Legends, and Darkness. From the end of the 4th century until the 6th, most of Britain goes remarkably quiet. At least little can be found in writings. Our authors of earlier ages have ceased and little remains in its wake. Perceptions in the Western Empire, even as early as in the beginnings of the 5th century, was a Britain once again ruled by barbarians. As the poet Claudius Claudanius put it, They spoke, Britain, wrapped in the skin of some Caledonian monster, her cheeks tattooed in azure clothing, rivaling the surge of the ocean, sweeping to her feet. Gone is the province, that birthplace of usurpers, and in its place was the horror of barbarians who enwrapped the island in Rome's wake. It is a stirring image. It surely shows the Romans how easy it was to backslide in the outer reaches into barbarianism. Again, for Rome, Britain fell. Not simply was it released, but Rome was pushed out for a new captain, a new lover. However, it is now time to talk about perspective. The period from 390 to 550 AD is at best one of speculation and scrambling around at the understandings based on scant evidence either in the sources and the slightly vague archaeology. In some ways, it's more conflicting and even more perplexing than it was in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, where things are much more straightforward and easier to perceive just based on other tendencies. You don't get that in the Dark Ages. In this period, we find ourselves trying to understand based on mythology and legend that is carried forward from various authors and whether pseudo-history amounts to real history. In a way, we know roughly what happened, and when. We know the Romans finally pulled out foreign armies from the province of Britain around 407 AD. These troops were the final strings attaching Britain to the Western Empire, and without it, civil and military control became native once more. Then, sometime after that, a cultural shift and a population shift created a group called the Anglo-Saxons. This group, made up of foreigners and locals, waged war against the Romano-British cultural structures and population. Eventually, this alliance would explode into five main nations of Anglo-Saxon England, while the Roman British would cease, and in their place would be the Scots, the Cornish, and the Welsh. Each would be ruled by a combination of kings, tyrants, and thugs. The problem has always been, how did we get there? That is where we stumble along, trying to find light in a moonless night. What has risen in its place is a mixture of pseudo-history, myth-making, and legend. Polemical tracts from Gildas to partisan opinions of Bede and Ninius dominate our sources. Of the three, only Gildas lived within sight of the changes that must have destroyed the old order. Even he was living a hundred years beyond that. Eventually, things would be rebuilt. Eventually, our understanding of what went after becomes clearer but at the same time, there is little to guide us. We struggle, actually, in the dust of confusing archaeology, useless discussions over whether legendary sources existed or not, and struggling to try and understand and pull apart what has happened. And as we talk forward and as we go through what went on, that's going to become a constant thing that we'll look back on for at least, well, possibly for the rest of this podcast at the end of the day. The establishment of what we now call Wales, England, and Scotland comes about in part because of the changes that happen here, and the way that everyone understands history comes out of the changes that happened here. For a long time, we believed that the Saxons landed on the invitation of British populations after the Romans pulled out, and then not happy with just taking a little bit of the land, decided after dealing with Picts and, and basically being the hired thugs and the mercenaries, to actually take on the British and actually establish their own places and started to destroy the British that were there previously and move in their own people and through cultural genocide and through actual genocide take over what we now call England. The reality, of course, has always been different than that. Our understanding of where that came from and how that came to be has been unfortunately influenced by the three authors I just mentioned, and each one kind of using the other as the backup, like Bede is writing on the perspective from Gildas. 
you can tell because he talks about exactly the same source points for the Anglo-Saxon settlements, same three people even, and how they came across to Britain in the first place through Vortigern, the king. All of this is purely, I wouldn't say speculation. I think there is rational understanding that some of this has a grain of truth in it, but we have to understand that what we're talking about is very different from the reality. Much like everything else, our understandings these days determine a lot of things, like the perception of one person about what happened September 11th, 2001, is very different from another. I, you have conversations with people who are completely convinced that the American government caused the destruction of the Twin Towers. You have people absolutely convinced that that was not the case, but other people who are convinced of a different subject and a different idea, and then build up a separation of time between that being actually written down, then you kind of get to the concepts that we deal with now, which is in this case, which is there is no firm ground. We only understand all of this based on a combination of guesswork. And even with the archaeology, which gives us further information and helps us to understand, and has in some ways picked apart the old arguments, it also has muddied some of the waters because there's no guarantee that what it says is completely and 100% accurate either because our own estimations on things can be different. Archaeology has learned over the last few, well, at least the last couple of decades that guessing on gender is a dangerous thing because sometimes gender doesn't look the same in death as it did in life. And our understandings of what you're buried with doesn't determine your gender. The, even the understandings of our dimensions of our skeletons doesn't necessarily determine our gender. And all of these things have made things a lot more difficult. DNA evidence helps. But even then, if we look at the DNA evidence that we talked about in the Bronze Age and about the Celts, it is no panacea of solutions. We can't assume that just because the DNA says one thing, it doesn't mean that something else wasn't going on at the same time. It doesn't mean that there wasn't groups of Germans moving here. And some of the DNA evidence points to the fact that there wasn't a wholesale slaughter of the Romano-British, that they took on cultures that were different than their original. And the whys and the hows that they did that are the part that we would love to know, and it's the most difficult to understand. We, again, make historians, archaeologists, and scholars in general make lots of guesses. We just don't know for sure, firmly, what the answers are. Until we can find somebody having written something down from the period, we just have to guess. And as we go along in this podcast, these questions are going to remain for us. The memories of people, even as far back as 15 years ago, can be questioned, can be argued. The written and visual evidence that we have of how things happened in a modern age gives us a lot better insight, but even at that, people still question what they see. You know, the answers of our eyes aren't always the answers, and sometimes we see what we want to see when we look at things. And so as we go forward into the Middle Ages, which we'll start to do in the next couple of episodes, I, I want you to keep that in mind because Welsh history is full of this question. Is there an Arthur? Isn't there? Does it matter? Does it make any difference to Wales as a nation that there is no Arthur? Does it make a difference to the nation that there was no actual Saxon invasion, but rather a cultural acceptance of a Germanic people? Does it matter that it was really Britons fighting against Britons and not an invasion force that created this problem of this period? Does it matter that the tyrants, as they call them, these kings that Gildas takes great pride in basically ripping to shreds for not keeping the Christian ways, were good Romans? You know, does it matter that there was a split even amongst the Britons as to who to follow? Because there definitely is signs that there was a Romano-British and a British following in that period, that some followed the dictates and the ideas of Rome and continued to hold them dear, while other sides switched and changed and became much more British and native in their mentality and thinking. Keep in mind that even as Roman Britain was settled and controlled, not all of it was covered, not all of it had Roman influence. We talked previously about the Hlin Peninsula and how it didn't actually even have any Roman roads, it didn't have any Roman settlements, it didn't have any Roman forts or soldiers that 
typically went there. So in its place, it became one of the first places that was invaded by Irish people. It became settled by Irish people at some points and became a point of contention in that era later as the Roman hold on Britain started to crumble. And one of the questions we always will end up in in this situation is how do we how do we understand this? How do we come to a conclusion based on this understanding? And I'm going to argue there isn't an easy way to make a conclusion. I would argue, in fact, much like the argument over the Celts, it is what you think it is. And if you think that it is what, you know, the old writers say it is, then you will think that regardless of what I say. If you think that modern archaeology has proven that there were no real Anglo-Saxon people that came to Britain as Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, but rather that this was basically a Roman-British conversion to a different culture, then anything I'm going to say after this is not going to make a difference to you. Maybe you can be swayed, but likely once you get in these camps, you can't be swayed. It's like a discussion about Arthur. We're going to talk about Arthur. Some people hate the idea that we're going to talk about Arthur. They don't want to hear about Arthur. Other people want to hear about Arthur, but they want to hear about him in the way that they understand him to be. Be it a historical figure or a legendary figure, they have a very predetermined notion about who this person that's called Arthur is. And we're going to talk a little bit in depth about that. And we're going to talk about why it's become such a big deal. And we're going to look back on people like uh, Magnus Maximus, who's kind of the... I would argue, the initial linchpin of this discussion about Arthur and this whole concept of someone who goes away and is expected to come back and save the people and how this continues from that period right up until on Glyndur, we have this argument about can a Welsh leader, hero, come back and save you, you know, from the fill in the blank, be it the barbarians, be it the Anglo-Saxons, be it the Normans. And when it's fulfilled in quotes by Henry the Seventh, does it actually make people happy <laughs> when the Tudors finally do what has been promised for so long and put the Welsh king on the throne of Britain? Did it actually solve anything? Did it cure that need, that angst amongst the Welsh that they were robbed of the leadership of Britain and that it gave them back that There is some perception and some belief that there is an argument to be made that there were some, at least in Welsh society, who did feel like that, who did feel that when Henry Tudor took over the English throne, he, in effect, put Wales back on the map. The realities, of course, are always nuanced. They're always different from the way we perceive them. But I just want you to know as we go forward that this is this discussion of the early Middle Ages, late antiquity, however you want to call them, is going to be wrought with a lot of things that we can't deal with properly. We're going to have a lot of questions, but not a lot of answers. And this will continue in Wales for quite some time. Realistically, until the writings past Ninius kind of get out of the old legendary and get back into writing historical ideas and chronicling people's lives, we won't really get to that point for quite some time. But we're going to do our best based on what we have. We do have the Welsh Chronicles or the Annals of Wales. We have Ninius. We have Gildas. We have even Bede, one would argue, who gives us perspectives about what happened in that early Middle Ages when things were still in chaos, when things were still being formulated, when kingdoms and principalities were still gaining power, and when we finally firm up who the actual kings are and who which kingdoms are the important ones and how influential they are, a lot of the legendary beginnings of them are going to be thrown and cast aside simply because they're not legitimate, <laughs> or if they're legitimate, they're unprovable. And unfortunately, one person we're going to have to talk about later on is Geoffrey of Monmouth, who gave us a history of the kings of Britain. And you can't see it, but I've put up a quote marks for that, because honestly, it's been acknowledged that most of what he's writing, if it's not falsehood, is pretty close to falsehood, or is using books that just don't exist anymore because so much of it is so speculative and such literary fantasy in some ways that you can't take him at face value and you can't accept what he's saying. And unfortunately for a lot of the people that love the King Arthur legend, he is responsible for some of it. And it's him, along with Ninius, who have given us our best glimpses at a figure who we can't really understand. And 
that problem is going to haunt us for quite some time because how do you then define anything if you can't trust the sources? And so we're going to crawl around a lot and I'm going to say words like, we just don't know, I just can't be sure, the sources are conflicting or the sources say this, but who knows? All of this will be very much a part of our discussion for the next possibly 10 to 15 episodes. And I just want you to understand that. Now, we're going to probably move quicker than maybe some like because of this. Because of this vacancy of evidence, we're going to be a lot speedier than I would like to be. I mean, I'd love to cover things in depth. I'll do my best to kind of give you a cultural understanding of what's going on and kind of talk about the way the day-to-day life of a Briton, or specifically a Welsh person of that era, is like. But, I mean, as you saw from the end of the Roman period, we lost a lot of perspective once the sources stopped focusing on Britain, and we lost things like we don't have past the second century. We don't have a woman mentioned ever again in Britain from a Roman perspective. We don't get a lot of even male perspectives, and the only time we do, it's typically when a usurper or an emperor is trouncing around Britain for some reason. And unfortunately, that will continue for a little bit. I will, however, say that I will give you what some of the legends say and what they are commenting on, and try and give a historical perspective when possible, give you some background of the area that this may have come from, try and help you understand, you know, where it's at. As much as I can, I can't guarantee I'll always be correct, because a lot of this is guesswork, and later evidence may prove everything I'm saying to be not completely accurate, and I understand that, and I accept that, and I think going forward, it's something we have to live with. Eventually, later things may point out that What we thought now wasn't totally correct. But this is what we have to work with. We will do our best to try and present a fair and a balanced presentation of what the Welsh Middle Ages are like, how they are perceived by the people in them. And as soon as we get nearer to the Viking Age and nearer to the Norman Age, most specifically, we will start to get chronicles of actual leaders and we'll get a lot more insight on what the population was doing, on what they were wearing, on what they were drinking, on basically how they acted from day to day. And we'll talk about that and we'll go much more in depth on the cultural understanding, which unfortunately we lose a lot of as time goes on in this period because we just don't have enough evidence. I didn't spend a lot of time on what Roman Britons wore or what they did because likely they weren't terribly different from what most Romans wore. Most Romans did. They, depending on the area you were in, you kept similar lifestyles, right? You had villas, you had underfloor heating, you had baths, and a lot of the ways that they worked through that were covered in this. The other thing we are going to talk a lot more about, and something we can get more in depth on, is the religious life and why there's a Christian Celtic church that is different than the Catholic church from Rome and what those differences are and why that becomes a big deal and why Bede, writing polemically himself, uh, goes into detail about how come that difference was important to Roman Britain and specifically on the results between the Anglo-Saxons and the British. And I think it's a very interesting discussion I think there's a lot of nuances within it, which I think are great to talk about, and we'll definitely cover more of that. I look forward to getting into more of that and less of scrambling around and saying, sorry, I don't understand, I don't know, I can't tell you. But I will say, we will cover some of the 5th century as we go through. But as I'm saying now and and being rational, there isn't much I can give you over and above what archaeologists have been able to tell us because the written evidence is so scant. It's really difficult to say. We can give you what the legend says, but the legend doesn't necessarily tell us the story. It just tells us what the legend became. And there's a lot of legendary history out there, and typically it's wrapped around religious literature. So we have to work within that storyline, and we have to understand that that is the case here. There's a almost religious nature about the way the Angles and Saxons and Jutes arrive and start to take over the territory. It has almost a biblical sort of stereotypical standpoint of, you know, throwing the evil backsliders out. Bede writes quite critically of the Britons in effect saying that they were a fallen people and deserved what they got. Whereas Gildas basically curses all the leadership and 
says that he's almost like a Jeremiah looking at the end of his people because they were so wicked and so unwilling to follow God's plan that they allowed the Saxons to come in and destroy them. And so this is kind of the stuff we're dealing with and this is what we're going to work with. And as I said, I will give you both what the sources say, what the archaeology says, and kind of my own interpretation of that based on other people's writings, and hopefully we can give you a much fuller and better understood way of seeing the world of the Middle Ages, and specifically from a Welsh perspective, to get to grips with how what we know of Wales came to be in this period, because really, the foundations for what Wales became start here. And I look forward to continuing that discussion with you. Uh, we'll talk more in depth as we start next week to talk about the gods and thank you everyone and we'll talk to you next time if you would like to get in contact with me if you want to hold a conversation if you want to dispute anything i've said here or clarify things for me that would be great you can do so at the welsh history podcast at gmail.com or you can contact me on twitter at welsh history pod or Conversely, you can talk to me about other things on my other Twitter account, which is at John DMP, and you can find our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And I would encourage everyone, as I said, we have an ad at the beginning of this episode talking about our live stream, what we're doing on December 3rd and 4th, 24 hours of video games and other kind of gaming. It's a lot of fun. Did it last year. It's hilariously crazy. And I would encourage you to consider coming along because it's quite entertaining. And I would also encourage you to donate because the whole reason why we're doing this is to help out children's hospitals in North America. And if you can donate, that's great. If you can just come and cheer us on, that's awesome too. And we look forward to presenting it to you. Only a couple of weeks away now. Uh, until next time, though, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.